Our next speaker is Marty Heller. Marty is a senior research specialist with, at, with the Center for Sustainable Systems at the University of Michigan. Marty's expertise spans research on US food systems, including dietary choices and food waste. His current work is linking US dietary intake from the NHANES survey to environmental impacts. It's the first work of its kind, and we're looking forward to hearing more about it. Marty? Good morning, all. Uh, thanks so much to the committee for uh, inviting me to speak here, and, and thanks for the forum for um, keeping this, this discussion alive. I, I, I think it's, it's an important one um, for us all to be grappling with, and uh, I've, I've been really valuing the, the conversation over the past day. Um, just a quick overview. I want to start with um, considering why, um, why, why we want to think of diets as a means of reducing environmental impacts. I, I think we got a lot of this background yesterday. I want to add a, a slightly different perspective, why, why thinking about diets is important. Um, and then we're going to look at, at some of those opportunities for environmental reductions, um, particularly in the U.S. We saw them a, a lot of that um, evidence yesterday on, on more of a global level. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the U.S. And, and look at the U.S. diet from a couple different perspectives, from sort of a, an average food availability perspective, as well as um, from a, a diet survey perspective, what, what individuals are reporting they're eating. Um, so, let's see, there we go. So my starting point for this, for thinking about uh, why we need to consider diets, um, really comes, stems from a, a collection of projection studies uh, that look at where population growth and food demand are headed and how that compares to what um, the predictive models are telling us we need to reduce our emissions to stay within, um, with, within an acceptable uh, global climate. And we've, we've seen these projections repeatedly. Uh, and I, I'm giving four examples here. There's, there's probably many more. And I'm going to borrow um, from the first one from the hedonist study just to, to show this example. But um, here what we're seeing, uh, the, the lines across the top here are sort of what the models are saying we need to reduce global emissions to in order to stay within the, the two degree um, Celsius um, safe range of avoiding um, dangerous climate change. And then the bars here are um, projections that the reference is, is FAO projections of, of population growth and, um, and you know, increased demand for foods. And, and we see that, that out here in the 2050, 2070, um, that, that food requirement for our growing population occupies all of that available emission space, if we want to say with, stay within that safe zone. So you know, that also requires room for, for other sectors of the economy, uh, energy, industry, um, other land use changes. Um, when we add things like the increased productivity that Frank was just speaking about globally and, you know, um, approaches to estimating this vary, uh, as well as uh, technical mitigations such as uh, manure management and reduced methane, brings us down somewhat, but still the, the general conclusion is that um, those production side improvements are not sufficient to get us to a, a safe place and demand side reductions really are necessary. And usually when people talk about demand side reductions, we're thinking about um, uh, reduced animal-based foods and reduced food waste. Um, and, and why, we, you know, we see, saw this graph a number of times yesterday, just the, the big discrepancies um, in greenhouse gas emissions between plant-based foods and, and animal-based foods. Uh, and, you know, I, I certainly appreciate a lot of the comments about how making these comparisons on a kilogram basis isn't always appropriate, but it gives us a, a scale here, and that's really why we choose to um, compare diets uh, anyways. So um, thinking about the U.S. diet and, and what those potential shifts are, one, one starting place that, that we considered is 
what would happen if the U.S. shifted to, to our recommended diet? And to answer this question, we started with, um, with USDA's loss at, whoops, sorry. Um, back, there we go. With USDA's loss adjusted food availability data set um, as a proxy for a current data diet, um, you know, this is disappearance of food in, in, in the economy and then adjusted for losses. Um, and that's showing us having an average caloric intake of 2,500 calories. That's, that's probably excessive, but that's what this data shows. Um, we then compared that against uh, the dietary guidelines, the 2010 dietary guidelines food patterns, um, both at that, that current caloric intake and a caloric intake that's closer to what um, would be recommended. Uh, you know, I, I realize that this, this is now an outdated guidelines. The changes to the 2015 seem to be um, pretty subtle and, and I don't think really will, will influence um, these results. So when we look at the greenhouse gas emissions from the average diet, this is where we see contributions um, across different food types. Um, meat in, in total, and this, this is uh, red meat, so uh, beef, pork, and lamb is 48% uh, of the total. Beef is 84% of that, so 40% of the total from beef. Um, all dairy together is 20%, and then all the plant-based foods is another uh, 22%. Um, if we consider the, the changes from our current diet that are required to meet dietary guidelines, we're, we're, many of us are familiar with this, um, increases in fruits and vegetables, of course, increases in seafood, um, dietary guidelines are, are recommending a doubling from our, our current dairy, dairy intake, um, and I'm showing this at, at two different caloric um, uh, intakes. And then when we translate that into um, greenhouse gas emissions, we see, of course, a, a slight increase from those fruits and vegetables, notable decrease because of the, the decreases in meat, poultry, and eggs to meet recommendations, uh, as well as this increase from dairy. And at, at the end of the day, the, the, the net emissions um, at a, a constant caloric intake, we're seeing a 12% increase in greenhouse gas emissions going to the recommendations. And if we made that 20% that decrease to you know, closer to what our, um, our caloric intake should be, it's you know, roughly the same as our, our current emissions, about a 1% decrease. Um, so we also uh, carried that through to some of the other food patterns within the dietary guidelines. Uh, so uh, this lacto-ovo-vegetarian food pattern, a 30% decrease from current vegan. And then we also looked at um, Harvard's healthy eating plate, which um, is based on, on epidemiological information on what promotes uh, um, health. And uh, in general, is calling for less red meat um, in the diet and less dairy than, than the um, dietary guidelines. And the interesting thing here for me is that we're seeing a similar reduction um, without eliminating meat from the diet as we do um, with a lacto-ovo-vegetarian. Um, so, you know, it begins to, I think, point at some directions that this is an, an absolute um, a, type of situation. We don't need to necessarily think about, um, you know, all or nothing, vegetarian or, or, or bust. Um, of course, everything I've showed you so far um, looks at just the consumed portion of the food. Um, the part that's wasted is an additional 30% um, on top of that. A, th a third of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with our diet are, uh, are from food waste. Um, that's equivalent to uh, 33 million cars on, on, on the road when we, we total it up for the whole population. And that's not including the, um, the greenhouse gas emissions associated uh, with disposing of that, that food waste. If we assume we, we landfilled it all, which of course we don't landfill it all, but um, assuming we did, it would add another 30% to that. So, um, put some of these in perspective. So the, the, the food waste contribution is roughly the same as the, 
the reduction we would see of going from the recommended uh, omnivorous diet to the lacto-ovo vegetarian diet. Just to put um, some of these pieces in perspective. Uh, other researchers have taken a very similar approach of using this food availability data and comparing it against dietary guidelines. Um, some folks at Carnegie Mellon uh, weren't willing to accept the, the caloric intake that the, the food availability um, data gives us and adjusted things a bit by the caloric intake um, and also considered a few other environmental um, impact uh, indicators, but they also saw that a shift from recommended uh, or shift from the current diet to a recommended food mix and caloric intake would, um, would result in an increase in greenhouse gas emissions, significant increase in, um, in fossil energy use, and also an increase in water use. I want to quickly share some, um, some work from Christian Peters at Tufts, um, who takes a little bit of different perspective on this, but again, using roughly the, the, the same um, diet basis, the same information. So um, Peters is looking at carrying capacity, which basically is considering land use, right? How do, we, how do I use our land? And carrying capacity is basically the number of persons that can be fed on, on our agricultural lands, right? Um, you know, we mentioned, or Frank mentioned a lot of um, concern with uh, marginal lands and uh, how that contributes to our food diet. So, um, so again, they're using uh, this the, the food availability as their baseline and looking at average crop yields and some average livestock r rations to determine how much land is required to feed the population with a, a, a given um, with with a given diet. And they found that our, our current carrying capacity is about 130 percent of our of our population of the 2010 population. I mean, we, we, we export a lot of food, right? We and we have a lot of agricultural land. Um, so they then looked at what would happen if we shifted to some of these recommended diets. Slight increase um, to the omnivorous um, dietary guidelines. You know, this is a little better than Meatless Monday. This is a little better than you know meat on Sunday kind of thing, one, once a week, uh, 250 times our, or, you know, two and a half times our, our population we could support on, on the land. And, you know, when we get down into here of eliminating all the animal products, this is where we see some of those trade-offs um, with using marginal land. But I think that this, this points a little bit at, at how far um, we can go with that land use before we start to see some of those those negative uh, effects of uh, reducing uses of marginal land. So all of that is is looking at the U.S. diet as as an average as a whole. And of course, we we heard yesterday there's no such thing as an average diet, right? Um, so we are also interested in bringing this down to the individual level. Um, largely because that opens up a lot of possibilities, right? Uh, we can then start to, to link with um, demographics across the population, um, establish better understanding between some of these relationships between environmental impacts and health com outcomes, and, and really set the stage for some more nuanced modeling of dietary change. Um, and what I'm going to present here is some, some work that we published uh, earlier this year uh, doing this linking environmental or specifically greenhouse gas emissions and energy use um, to um, individual self-selected diets. So our starting point here is, is NHANES, the, the um, nutritional survey. We're using the 2005 to 2010 uh, years for that, um, just shy of 17,000 individuals. And um, you know, our task then is to link the foods that are, that are represented um, within those diets, some 7,000 as consumed foods to environmental impacts of producing those, which you know we're pulling from from the life cycle assessment literature. This is primarily most of what is available is primarily at a, on a food commodity basis. So that there's there's definitely the challenge of making those connections. Um, fortunately, some of that um, that uh, recipe uh, data was was already compiled for us. Um, so there's a food commodities intake database that 
takes these 7,000 foods and represents them as uh, compositions of, of roughly 300 food commodities. And then we did an exhaustive uh, literature, literature search and pulled data from the LCA literature uh, to, to populate this database that we're calling um, Data Field, uh, Database for Food Impacts on the Environment for Linking to Diets. And I should point out that that, that data is not exclusively from the U.S., uh, largely because um, U.S. data is pretty sparse and we just don't have a consistent data set, although there are efforts to develop that. So if anyone's interested in developing um, life cycle assessment data for the U.S., please see me afterwards. Um, so put this data database together, do a lot of uh, modeling to link it up with um, all of these NHANES data, uh, and you know, we, we get some, uh, some emissions per capita from the diet. Um, here I'm showing the consumed portion, and we also included losses. Of course, they don't show up in, um, people, in surveys of what people eat, so we had to add that in from, from other data. Um, and we also looked at energy use. Um, but really the interesting thing that comes out of this work is starting to be able to look at um, these emissions then as a distribution and, and, and how um, they vary across the population. Um, so here we're seeing a distribution with a, with a very long uh, tail on the high end. This is actually cropped off quite a bit here. Um, because of the... Uh, because of the, the, the variance in data from the literature where you're able to put a, a little bit of um, some variability on this. Uh, so here we're, we're seeing what the, the sort of high and low end of a 95% confi 95 confidence interval on each of those commodity foods, um, how it influences the overall results. You know, plus or minus 20% gives us a little sense of, of how accurate some of this, this data is. Um, but I think that this gets interesting when we kind of um, rank those individual diets um, by their greenhouse gas emissions and start to look at, at, at cumulative emissions across the population. And here we're dividing the, the, the total population up into quintiles, and we can see just how big the discrepancies there are in emissions from from the, the, um, the top emitters, the, this fifth quintile, to the bottom emitters, um, it's, it's roughly a, a eight factor of eight differences in, in, in the amount of emissions that those two groups are contributing, which, which was striking to us. So, I mean, we knew there was going to be variance, but um, it's, it's much greater than we were anticipating. Um, so what's driving those differences? Well, first of all, the, the data that I've showed you is per day. So there, there are um, notable differences in the total caloric intake. That, that upper quintile, the, the top emitters, um, are simply eating more calories. Um, but even if we normalize by that caloric intake, it's still uh, a, five, a factor of five difference between in, in greenhouse gas emissions between this upper quintile and the lower quintile. So, um, that's pointing to uh, differences in diet composition. Obviously, the blue bar, whoops, gosh. Um, well, we'll just, the blue bars here are, are the meat, um, and we see that in the upper quintile, uh, I'll, the majority of that is beef, where we're seeing a lot less beef in, in the, the low emission diet. Um, and, you know, poultry is showing up. And, much more contribution in this low uh, emission diets uh, compared to the, the upper emitters. Um, so quickly here, uh, so this is what those, those differences in intake look like. Um, I'm going to just focus quickly on, on the beef, uh, not to put all of the spotlight on beef, but um, so this is uh, differences relative to the mean intake. Um, which is roughly 51 grams in the U.S., so it's like a quarter pounder every other day. So this uh, upper quintile is more like a, a third of a pound every day of beef, just to give us a sense of where that is. Um, 
This figure is a little misleading because it, uh, it contains the caloric differences. Um, if we look at things per thousand kilocalories, um, we get a little better picture of how those upper and lower quintiles vary from, from the mean. Um, but then we wanted to look at just sort of a hypothetical diet shift of um, just to put some of this in perspective, right? So um, what we're doing here is uh, looking at what the contribution would be if those, those upper quintiles um, shifted to just an average emission diet. So again, we're, we're not talking about eliminating beef from the diet, but down to a quarter pounder every other day kind of thing. And we found that that would, you know, and that, that, that can be through a combination of both um, diet composition shifts, but also reductions in caloric intake. Um, for those 45 million Americans in that upper quintile, it would mean cutting their, their a average daily commute in half, roughly, 15 miles a day. If we stack that up um, every day of the year, it would bring us 10% closer to a achieving our, our climate targets. So again, starting to put some of these in perspective, just what the possibilities are, even if we're not going to extremes of, of, um, of vegetarianism. Um, conclusions here, I, th I think that these demand side changes are likely going to be needed to meet emission reduction targets, um, even with, and, and you know, I don't think this is an either or thing, and that needs to be along with a lot of the, uh, the efficiency improvements and, and technological advancements that, that Frank was talking about. Uh, significant reductions in environmental impacts are possible in the U.S. Um, and this, our modeling based on individual self-selected diets, I think, points to the wide discrepancies that we see in the U.S. in um, diet-related impacts and um, offers us kind of a different lens, a different perspective for thinking about uh, policy scenarios. I've given you a pretty one-sided look at environmental impacts, um, focused largely on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, of course, there are other environmental indicators and other aspects of sustainability that need to take, be taken into account here. Um, we're including those in our, in our research, um, so stay tuned for more work from us on that. Um, in particular, on this nutritional health, we're in process of adding water and land use impacts to our, our database as well. So um, with that, uh, Quick acknowledgement to my colleagues and uh, funding for this the individual diet work. Thank you.